Dennis Rodman rose from obscurity to become the NBA's bad boy. I was bigger than the game. I was actually more famous than the game. This is Dennis Rodman, as bad as he wants to be. Beyond the Glory, next on FSN. Rodman shoots from ahead of the key, drills a 20-footer. He is one of the greatest players in NBA history. Down the lane, Rodman. Amazing. There it is. Dennis Rodman's first career triple-double. I was bigger than the game. I was actually more famous than the game. I'm going to be the bride today. He went from a shy, non-assuming kid to a megastar. Most people evolved. He revolted. Oh, my goodness. Dennis Rodman in handcuffs, charged with misdemeanor battery. The party life kind of took its toll. Police say Rodman faces a number of charges, including driving under the influence of alcohol. They're not laughing with you anymore. They're laughing at you. It had gotten to a really bad, bad point. There's been many times I could have been six feet under easily. He really is very emotionally fragile. Yeah, yeah. He's one of the most strong-willed people I've met in my life. I think there's always going to be a mystery to him. I'm not going to die without completing what I've been put on his earth to do. This is Dennis Rodman, Beyond the Glory. Absolutely outstanding. Unbelievable. Very included in the Heat that on baseball. Do you have anything to say to your fans? March 2004. A minor league basketball game between the Kansas City Knights and the Long Beach Jam. And for Dennis Rodman, a humble return after four years to the game where he'd once been a superstar. Dennis Rodman is back. To go from being one of the greatest players in the world to playing for a team like the Long Beach Jam, I mean, you got to be able to swallow your pride and take a huge step back. When I started this venture, it wasn't for people to see that I could go play ball again. My goal was to get back in shape and just to look presentable. Rebound, Rodman. You know, I'm not doing this for people. I'm doing this for myself. For more than a decade, Dennis Rodman loomed larger than life. He was one of basketball's great performers and most colorful personalities. He's bohemian. He's full on Rouge movie, that's Dennis Rodman. I mean, he's creative. He's just a different kind of artist. He's not like an athlete, he's more like a rock star. When you say Dennis Rodman, <laughs> wait a moment, you are taking on more than, way more than, you're taking on 10, 11 guys in one, in one guy. But after leaving the NBA in 2000, Rodman made headlines for all the wrong reasons. While his lifestyle, fueled by alcohol, kept his closest companions in constant fear. I was concerned about him physically, I was concerned about him mentally, I was concerned about him in every way. The amount of alcohol he was consuming and the environment he was putting himself around and just the atmosphere, the element of people was just, it was crazy. I was scared to death. He's gonna party and rage till he's out of money, he's totally broke, and then he's gonna end his life. But Dennis Rodman's path has never been predictable. Now sober, he's determined to reinvent his story and his character one more time. No matter how crazy the ride is as you go along, you still come back to where you started. And that's where he's at. He's back to where he started. My life is a movie. You got your good points from the beginning of the movie. You got your sad point. You got your bad points. You know, you go and correct some of the mistakes you've done in the script. And then you end up with what? A happy ending. Dennis Rodman grew up with two younger sisters in the Dallas neighborhood of South Oak Cliff, a crime-riddled section of town. We have lived in some neighborhoods that was not the best neighborhoods, so I never could allow my kids to come home and be by themselves. Once people saw me, they thought I was going to be a bomb, a loser, go to jail, do drugs, uh, be dead, you know, because that's where I came from. Dennis's father, Philander Rodman, 
left the family behind when Dennis was three. He eventually fathered more than 25 other children. Anybody that don't have a father, it's kind of difficult just because you want somebody there. No one can ever take the place of your, you know, your natural father, you know, your blood. It didn't work out with my husband, and I always thought over the years that Dennis has always faulted me for that. I don't think it was her father. I think the fact that my father, he liked to produce, and he produced in every other, you know, dry way. With her husband gone, Shirley maintained strict discipline to keep her kids in line. She worked overtime to put food on the table, even driving the local school bus. I said I was mean and tough, but I genuinely loved the kids, but I think that I might have been able to give them a few more hugs, maybe wait back then, that might have been better, but I don't know if I had the time. I don't remember when my mother ever hugged me or anything. I don't remember that. I don't remember she ever embraced us and, and held us and, you know, I, I, I can't even think of one. Shirley's tough love kept her kids out of trouble. But while her daughters flourished, Dennis withdrew. Dennis was real shy. He's really shy. It was like, you know, he just wouldn't talk to anybody. The girls kind of overshadowed him a little bit. And I, I imagine it was pretty difficult for Dennis to cope with just women in his life. She tried to give me somebody to put in my life a male figure. She went like the big brother, big sister organization trying to go give me a big brother. But it wasn't the same. I mean, it was more like just pawning me off to somebody else. The one place Dennis came alive was on the basketball court. He teamed up with his sisters at a nearby gym. They were pretty much better than anybody. <laughs> they were better than everybody, even guys. I mean, they would go out there and play with guys like it was nothing. He played real good. It was like, you know, I was the point guard, you know, and he was the post player, and my sister was like a, a forward or something. I did that every day for like five or six hours a day. I just lived there. You know, I tried to go home and go to bed. But while Kim and Deborah became high school stars who drew college scholarships, Dennis drifted through his teens. He didn't have an interest in anything except for the gym and pinball machines, and that's it. I can't even begin to portray to you the shy young man that we're talking about, the one that held on to my skirt. The one was so shy he wouldn't even date. Dennis didn't even date. But Dennis was changing. At age 20, he abruptly shot up in height from five foot nine to six foot eight. Even today, I still feel like that, you know, I'm not a big person, but sometimes I catch myself like, wait a minute, hold on, I'm 6'8". Wow, I'm Dennis Rodman, you know, I'm Dennis, this guy. Playing in the gym, Dennis caught the eye of college scouts. In 1983, coaches from southeastern Oklahoma State tracked him down at home and offered him a scholarship. I think that really put a light on top of my head and said, wait a minute, hold on. I gotta do something in my life and it's gotta be something positive. Southeastern Oklahoma State was in the middle of rural farm country. Dennis was living at the college that summer and coaching a basketball camp when he met an 11-year-old local boy named Brian Rich. I was a foot smaller than everybody, so I had to really, you know, dig down and hustle, and, you know, I mean, that's what he kind of liked. Every day that week, he came by my side the whole time. He was with me the whole time. He did everything I did. He went to practice, well, I went to practice. If I die on the floor, if I die, he died. If I go jump in the stands, he goes, I mean, every little thing I did, he did it. And he pulled a good one on me the last day of the camp. He said, why don't you come to dinner in my house? I'm like, what? And I'm 11 years old. And, uh, you know, they're thinking, well, I'm going to, you know, bring one of my buddies home. They're same age, same size, you know. And then I come walking in the door with, <laughs> with a 6'9 black guy. You know, there's not a whole lot of black people up there. His dad looked at me like I was some lost alien or something. He's like, wait a minute, hold on, this your friend? This is your friend? <laughs> this six eight black guy, 22 year old guy is your friend? Everybody was kind of uneasy at first because it was like, you know, having dinner with the president, you know? <laughs> when I went there, he uh, sprung another one on me. He said, uh, yes, mother, father, could I uh, spend a night? And they just looked and dropped their jaw jaws and said, hmm. Hold on, we'll be right back. I said, hey, just let him stay the night and take him back in the morning. And from that day on, from that day on, I was with that family for four years.
After 22 years at home, Dennis Rodman was going to college in rural Oklahoma and earning his keep on a family farm. Right before you go to school, 5.30, got to go to school at 9. Um, come back home, got to go to work. That's like it, you know, every day. We had about a 1,500-acre farm that we raised a lot of cattle on. We just kind of told him, if you stay here, you're going to get treated just like the rest of the guys around here. There's chores to do, bailing hay, hauling the hay, putting it in the barn. They taught me more about life than, than anything. You know, about living a hard life, getting up in the morning at 5.30, going to plow, going to get the cows up, going doing this, doing that, where I'm actually working. And I think that the values they taught me carried on to the game of basketball. At Southeastern Oklahoma State, Dennis was an instant sensation and an All-American for three straight seasons. First game, I think he scored 42 points and grabbed like 20 rebounds. Everybody's like, who is this guy, you know? After that, he packed the gym every night. I was just excited. I was just excited just to be you know, here and just, you know, just enjoying the game. In the spring of 1986, Dennis led his team to the NAIA Final Four. NBA scouts took notice. That summer, he was drafted by the Detroit Pistons. I was just happy just to be anywhere. <laughs> just anywhere, I didn't care. I just said, okay, now it's time we need to go to work. And it's fortunate that it was Detroit and the people there took me in. Life in the NBA was a giant leap from small town Oklahoma. But Pistons coach Chuck Daly took Dennis under his care. He needs a little bit of guidance and maybe a, you know, a little bit of father figure to tell him what to do. And, and uh, Chuck was really good with him on that. This was a kid who was definitely a fish out of water. And so Chuck was like, you know, come to my house for Christmas. Come to my house for Thanksgiving. He felt attached to me and I felt attached to him because he knew all the frustration I was going through as far as making it and trying to play, play, play. I wanted to play so bad. And I never let him down. Not one time, never let him down. Here's Robin with a steal, and Dennis with that quick slam. The Pistons were the NBA's bad boys, a team that fought opponents tooth and nail. Dennis fit right in. I wasn't trying to be famous to doing dirty work. I was just making it fun to do it and enjoy to do it. We call him big man, because he played the big man. He played like a big man. He played way outside of himself. Dennis loved to play against who everybody considered to be star. You got Mark McGuire, we got like Larry Perry, Magic Johnson. All those guys, I was so great, so good. And I just wanted to see if I could stop these guys. Dennis did just that. By 1990, he was an all-star and a defensive stopper as the Pistons won their second straight title. He felt like he'd found a home. I just looked at those guys like, hey, these are my brothers, you know, that they look over me, they look after me, they take care of me, so I got to give something back. And the things I was giving back to is this, my heart and soul and my love for the game. He really loved that team. He really loved Detroit, period. The NBA's Defensive Player of the Year, Dennis Rodman. But after their championship seasons, the Pistons came apart. Key players were traded away. Then coach Chuck Daly resigned, breaking up the family for good. Where's Dennis gonna go to Christmas dinner and then Thanksgiving dinner? Who's he gonna be able to talk to? Your father disappears, you gotta be your own man, you might not be ready to be. When he loves somebody and cares for people, and then they leave him, he it hurts him. And he doesn't recover as fast as a lot of people. He doesn't move on, he can't move on. Dennis's life was unraveling off the court as well. In 1993, he married model Annie Banks, his long-term girlfriend and the mother of his young daughter, Alexis. But the couple divorced after just 82 days. Annie took custody of their daughter and refused to let Dennis see her. He was too young and they were both too immature at the time to be in that kind of relationship. Uh, she had her own problems, and he had his, and, and they, I guess they were throwing them against each other. That was like the last, the last straw for Detroit. I know, that was it for me. I just said, screw it, screw it. I'm not dealing with this anymore. 
he couldn't see his daughter. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that was kind of hitting him all at one time, and he just kind of broke down. One night, the police found Dennis sleeping in his pickup truck with a shotgun in the back. He'd left behind a note that some believe was a suicide threat. I think he had probably called her up and told him he was going to do this and this, blah, 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 whatever. He kind of went out on the limb and was trying to get somebody's attention. I wasn't going to kill myself. <laughs> Physically, I wasn't going to do that. I just wanted to have something in my hands and, 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 and imagine and visualize that I did it. That I did it to kill this, this person that, that that i become. You know, such a follower, not a leader or not a person that can stand on his own two feet. I have to have something to keep me, you know. I didn't know what to do. With his team and his marriage in shambles, Dennis Rodman vowed to change his life. If you could imagine how thorough that change would be. That moment made a great turning point in my life and said, well, okay, all right, now, you know, let's find out what this new identity is gonna take you. After seven seasons with the Detroit Pistons, Dennis Rodman's life was in tatters. His coach departed, his team broken up, his marriage destroyed. He didn't believe in, in his teammates, he didn't believe in basketball, he didn't believe in anybody. Everything started to diminish, uh, just, just disappear in front of my eyes. Traded to San Antonio after the playoffs in 93, Dennis vowed to reinvent himself from the top down. He'd gone through a really traumatic, emotional time. And, and that summer when he got traded to the San Antonio Spurs, he saw the movie Demolition Man. And that is why he dyed his hair originally blonde. I went and got my hair dyed, and that's when my life changed completely. We end up rooming together, still got the blonde hair, and jokingly, I say, you know, why don't you dye it green? And the next day, he shows up with a green. The other day, I started to dye my hair different colors, and all of a sudden, kids all over Texas color hair everywhere. Every game, people came to look at my hair. They came to see what's different about me. Then I started getting pierced, I started getting tattoos. The more extravagant he was, you know, the, the, the more of an entertainer he became and the more the people loved him. He went completely ballistic in San Antonio. He shocked those people out of their boots. No one in basketball looked anything like Dennis. No one played like him either. I went through every day every game performing the way, you know, like it was no tomorrow. He was like a cartoon character who happened to be the greatest rebounder the game's ever seen. A lot of it had to do with, you know, his childhood and him wanting to, to become a superhero, you know, and, and wanting to be a superman and, and have a coat of armor where no one could ever hurt Dennis again. I wasn't trying to teach kids any bad values. You know, I was just doing things that I wanted to do as a kid. Dennis was living out his fantasies off the court as well. Madonna had been at the, one of the games that we're watching the tape on, and she said, one guy that I really would be interested in is Dennis Rodman. And we looked at each other and said, OK, we got to make this happen. She was a free spirit go-getter. Um, I don't give a damn what you think about me. And pretty much that's what I was. Dennis loved putting people at edge. So since you're going to stare at him anyway, it's going to give you something to look at. But Dennis's flamboyant lifestyle clashed with San Antonio's cultural climate and the religious values espoused by the team's top star, David Robinson. I was the devil. He was, the, he was God. He was Jesus. And I was, you know, so they, people said, well, you know, he's not going to fit in. And they tried to talk to me and tell me to go to church and give me my Bible. I'm like, no, I'm going to do my job. You do your job. Dennis led the league in rebounds for the fourth time in the 94-95 season, as the Spurs posted the best record in the league. But when San Antonio lost to Houston in the conference finals, Dennis took the heat. Dennis played exceptionally well in that series and, and dominated, but you had to either point the finger at David Robinson or, or Dennis Rodman. So they pointed the finger at Dennis Rodman. 
Dennis landed on his feet. He was traded to the Chicago Bulls. Three-time NBA champions with the greatest player in the game. And a coach who knew exactly where Dennis was coming from. In Chicago, if Dennis got a technical foul or kicked the ball in the stands or, you know, did something outlandish, you'd look down and Phil Jackson would have a smile and a smirk on his face and be like, I used to do that. I really wasn't trying to physically hurt anybody. And the photographer is hurt. It was just the heat of the moment and the things that I did was more like, okay, great, I'm gonna do this and hopefully that, you know, things will be cool. But, uh, you know, I could have did a lot of worse, a lot, a lot worse things than that besides kicking somebody, I could have punched somebody in the face. Seven technicals for the season, no suspension. Taking each other to the floor. Dennis will take off the jersey. Throws it to the floor. Dennis Rodman is irate. Oh, that stupid Rodman. Phil Jackson wrote a book called Maverick. Uh, Dennis Rodman wrote a book, Bad As I Want to Be. It's the same book. Plays, does his job, he comes to practice, he keeps his mouth shut, he works hard every day. He's never delinquent. He's just a very easy person to have on a basketball team. Phil Jackson knew that I was gonna be there to work and and and, and do my job. He knew that that what he can always count on. As far as everything else, he had no control, he didn't want no control, he didn't want nothing to do with that. Dennis rewarded his coach's trust. His work habits in Chicago became legend. He would spend literally 24 hours a day in the weight room, basically pumping iron all night and sleeping in the training room. I go for a game, I work out, work out, you know, 45 minutes. After the game, I go and do another 45 workout, do the treadmill or whatever. That's, I think that was a mental part of my life that was really focused. Bobby again leading the league in rebounds, 15.5. The results were dramatic. With Dennis doing the dirty work, the Bulls became an NBA dynasty. I didn't miss a beat with, you know, about all the things I was doing off the court. I didn't miss one beat. On the court, no one worked harder than Dennis Rodman. Off the court, no one played harder. I really didn't do anything before a game because I knew I had to perform the next night. What, the days in between? Man, it was like on. It was like on. It was like play ball matching every night. He was, had social anxiety, very antisocial, and he started drinking because of it. And it, it made him, you know, talk to people and communicate, become fun, become the life of the party. The guy would go out, party, stay out all night, come to a game and get 30 rebounds. Who's going to say that he was doing something bad? With Dennis, if he eats, you eat. If he's shopping, you're shopping. If he's having the fun, he wants to make sure you're having fun. If he's gambling, he's giving you chips so you can gamble. And other things as well. Check this out. As long as the Bulls were winning, Dennis could do no wrong. The more outrageous his exploits, the more popular he became. I'm going to be the bride today. I would dare to say at one point in time, Dennis might have actually been the biggest name in Chicago. And that's big. I mean, to say that he was at least as big as Michael Jordan is, is just crazy. He was that loved at one point in the city. The crush of media, spectators, fans, and police made for quite a divine entrance. No one threw rice, but Diva Dennis reveled in the reception. It's a publicity stunt. It is not. I can break people in the stands day in and day out without even shooting the ball. And that's unheard of. With Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, and Phil Jackson, Dennis Rodman turned the Bulls into the greatest show in sports. It's like traveling with the Beatles, man. Michael had a suite in this corner of the hotel. Phil had a suite on that corner. Scottie Pippen had a suite on that corner. And Dennis had a suite on this corner. Women 
walk up to us and start crying. Just like in awe that he was standing in front of them. It was like a rock star concert coming to town every night. Dennis never let up. During the 98 NBA Finals, he spent his off days partying in Las Vegas, then flew back to Utah for the series' decisive game. If we were in a must-win situation, I would take Dennis Rodman, I would hop on a plane, fly to Vegas, get him drunk all night, surround him by women, fly him in one minute before game time, I guarantee he'd have 35 rebounds and win the game. The Chicago Bulls have won their sixth NBA championship, and it's their second three-peat. That last game was like, thank you. You know, it's like, what if we could even celebrate us? We're like, okay, this is over. I was so just mentally drained for three years, running hard, running so hard. When you're flying that high, when you're like the peak of all peaks, there's nowhere else to go but down. Let's go, baby. VIP. Dennis Rodman helped the Chicago Bulls celebrate their third straight NBA title in 1998. Then management broke up the team, leaving Dennis high and dry. Can't go anywhere after that. You cannot go anywhere after, you know, that feat. It was very disheartening for Dennis. You win three championships, you're the greatest team in the world, and, and once again, he finds himself without a home. The Robin Watch continues here in Los Angeles. Rumors running rampant. Speculation is Dennis will sign any day, any minute. Dennis signed with the Los Angeles Lakers in the spring of 1999. Hopefully I'll be playing this week and hopefully that the, the Lakers and the people of uh, California will accept me for who I am and what I do. And uh, if they don't, I'll move on. But his heart wasn't in it. He was burnt out on the NBA. He didn't care if he really played or not. It's amazing that I'm not going to never win. <coughs> in this game of basketball, right? No matter what I do. He's an extremely emotional person. I mean, he puts on a facade of being a badass, but in reality, he really is a child. He didn't know where to go. He didn't have any goals or guidance or anything else. Or he did for three years have a little bit of structure. With two clashing stars and a rookie coach, the Lakers were in disarray as well. It's like, okay, you guys are unprofessional. You guys are bickering like little kids. Great. No one could be a bigger kid than me. Watch. Detroit, San Antonio, Chicago. I mean, all the teams I played for, it's more like everyone, you know, it was like, okay, great. Let's go do a job, you know, let's go have a beer later. This team is more like, oh, you son of a bitch. What, what, what are you doing down I me? Mean, the whole time, it's like, oh, great. It wasn't just the Lakers driving Dennis to distraction. A rocky romance with actress Carmen Electra included another short-lived marriage and a domestic feud that landed them both in court. In handcuffs, former Baywatch star Carmen Electra steps from a police transport van, also inside her on-again, off-again lover, Dennis Rodman. He gets caught up in relationships. That's more important to him than any game or anything else. I mean, he's succeeded at basketball already, but he's never succeeded at a relationship. We never saw each other. And uh, she started seeing other people, and I was doing my thing, the usual thing, having eight, nine girls. When she left him, that really sent him into a tailspin. He was really hurting, and it ended up ultimately costing him with the Lakers. Three weeks before the 99 playoffs began, the Lakers cut Dennis loose. That's the problem with being a bad boy. Whenever something goes wrong, we can pin it on you, because you're a bad boy. Rodman's skills were declining, but he could still draw fans. So in the spring of 2000, Mavericks owner Mark Cuban brought him to Dallas to do just that. Rebound, Rodman, yep, and a foul! 
He wanted me to feel the stance. He wanted people to come to the game. And what person, perfect person to do that to go get the clown. Rodman, great effort. Dennis came in, he did everything Mark said. All of a sudden, the games are selling out, and Dennis is putting on a show, and he's sitting on the floor, and he's acting like, you know, Dennis Rodman, the character. Technical foul on Rodman. He's been thrown out. Holy cow. Is this what they mean by Dennis being Dennis? Mark Cuban played him like a violin and then let him go. I don't get it. I really don't get it. I mean, I get the short and the stick every, every damn time. And, woo. I don't know. What am I doing wrong? With no other offers from NBA teams, Dennis went home to Newport Beach, California. His professional reputation was in ruins, but the party was just getting started. People are not going to you know, give me the opportunity anymore because of who I am, so I'm just going like, to just enjoy my life. So I had strength, you know, four times a week, five times a week, and it was, it was that, that kind of deal. Found a lot of guys that didn't have to go to work and they didn't mind getting drunk at 11 o'clock in the morning. Dennis's hedonistic lifestyle seemed glamorous when he was on top. Now it helped cloud the reality of his fading career. I said, whatever, I'm just gonna party, do this and that, you know, screw all the girls like I always do, you know, just whatever. And I was doing it. One year passes, another year passes, and Dennis falls into a situation where he is surrounded now by literally the lowest form of people a lot. None of these people have a life. None of them have jobs. They're all feeding off of his money and spending his cash. And Dennis had to never been one to say no to anybody. He's afraid that if he gets rid of them, now what do you have? Something is better than nothing. Yes. Oh, yeah. In the midst of all the partying, Dennis began a long-term relationship with Michelle Moyer eventually fathering two children with her, a son, DJ, and a daughter, Trinity. In the beginning, you know, it's something that draws you to him. He's like a magnet. He's got this really good soul. She's a strong individual. She's cool. I mean, she, she knows my stuff, and she said, okay, great, we get together, you know, have wild, crazy sex, and, you know, take care of our kids. We all good, and she loves that. We actually moved in with him to his beach home with the first child, and he continued to have the party, so I made a choice to kind of separate, yeah, separate me and uh, the kids from that. It was just a little too much. Dennis and Michelle married in 2003, but continued living in separate houses. I live here, and she lives there, you know, with the kids, so that's not nowhere near conventional. She accepts that, she understands that, you know, girls and people want to be around me to party. They want to party and have a good time, people like that, and it's hard for a woman to be with me because of that. It definitely takes a lot of strength, a lot of strength. In fact, sometimes I wonder where I get it, and I wonder if I'm going to continue to have it. They're a strange but good couple. Any woman in the world that gets involved with him, unless she lives in Siberia, knows what Dennis is about. So she's accepted a lot more, helped him a lot more, and put up with more than most women would. In the summer of 2003, Dennis announced an NBA comeback attempt but he made little effort to get into shape. Dennis, you're not going to practice at all this year? Well, I didn't do it all last year, so what's the difference? Why should you start right now? Well, I'm starting now. Order curtail his drinking. Beautiful. Before he needed it to become this social extrovert, now he needs it just to cope. I actually told him, you're not going to live another year or two because something's going to happen to you, whether it's a car accident or liver damage or nobody can possibly live their life this way. You can tell somebody to do something, but 99% of the time, they're not going to do it. So I just said, I had to prove to myself and make myself understand that I got to do this myself. He was not ready to stop at that point. And I wasn't ready to walk away at that point either. Early one morning, after spending the night at a Las Vegas strip club, Dennis crashed a motorcycle into a concrete pillar. He was charged with driving under the influence. For those who had always stood by him, it was the last straw. The motorcycle accident was about 
as much as we could take, all of us, his friends and family. I sat and said, you know, I can't change him. And I can't have him change for me or for his children. So at this point, I'm going to walk away. We actually gave an ultimatum, which was you either stop or we're done. I mean, I talked to Michelle, Darren talked to Michelle. She said she was done. Um, I was done. Darren was quitting. He had to make a choice. Either I'm going to lose it all, you know, or I'm going to make a decision and try to do this. He, at that time, agreed that he was going to take a alcohol inhibitor called Anabuse, which is a pill that if he takes it, he would get violently ill if he, if, uh, when he drinks. And he religiously started taking that pill. You got to prove it to yourself that, you know, that, uh, that what you're doing is, is, is right. If you're doing it for somebody else, that don't work. Because you'll eventually go back and do it. Fortunately for us, he listened. And he hasn't touched the bottle since. By the end of 2003, a sober Dennis Rodman was back in the gym, determined to confound fans and critics one more time. I just want to come and finish my, my goal, my dream, to finish the game the way I started. Four years after his last NBA game, 43-year-old Dennis Rodman is chasing a dream. Well, I'm going to rebound it from a lot of things in my life. I'm just rebounding it from drinking now to being sober. Now I'm trying to rebound it to go back into the NBA. Dennis is working toward a goal, and that is something that has given him purpose in his life because, let's face it, the last five years he had no purpose. His purpose in life was to get drunk and to party. He had no focus. So basketball has, has been his savior. In December of 2003, Dennis joined the Long Beach Jam of the American Basketball Association. His first pro game in four years. Rodman, offensive rebound, and he gets his first bucket. Three months later, he led them to the ABA title. The whole time he was playing with them, he was coaching them. It was incredible. It wasn't Dennis the menace. It was Dennis the mentor. It was Dennis the teacher. Yeah, but a lot of people didn't really think I can do something like that. And I just went out there and did it to show people I can actually go out there and, and coach players. I had to tell, show players, and they actually listened to me. Dennis hoped his performance would entice an NBA team to sign him up. But when the 2004 playoffs began, he was watching from the sidelines. Dennis would like to make a comeback now. There's no team in the NBA that will touch, touch Dennis Robin. And he'll deny that he watches basketball, but he's watching every damn playoff game every single night at his house by himself and, and missing it, really missing it. But Dennis has never been the type to take no for an answer. Week after week, he's retooling his body and priming himself for one last shot. I just want to come and finish my, my goal, my dream, to finish the game the way I started. If it does happen, this could be a feat that no one's ever, ever done in the game of basketball. Everybody's worried about, oh, well, is he going to make the NBA? I could care less. To walk away from that alcohol is huge. He is a completely different person. He's trying to turn his life around. And for me, it's, it's just, uh, I mean, it's exciting because I was scared to death for Dennis Rodman. Dennis is struggling to change direction off the court as well by becoming the father that he never had to his children. I look at her two years, she's straight like me. She gives no affection. No affection, she looks at you, she gives you all this, these, these weird looks like, you know, what are you looking at? 
my little boy is totally different. He, he'll sit there and kiss you and hug you, you know, and say, I love you 24 hours a day. DJ's got a really, really big heart. He's very loving, and so is his father. He's becoming affectionate with me and the children. And Trinity demands it. He doesn't have a choice with her. His youngest children, he's actually putting a lot of effort in, and he's putting an effort in with his older children, too. You know, he, he cares about all his kids. I think it's tough for Dennis to let anybody close to him, even these beautiful little creatures, these children of his, because he doesn't trust, and that all goes back to his dad. He does want to do this, and I know he's capable of it. I think he's just going to take a little longer than the norm, you know? I think he's, it's going to take him a little longer. I've always said maybe I can give the love to my kids that my father never gave us, so. But it's still hard to do that. No one knows for sure where Dennis Rodman is heading next. But for those who've watched him come this far, there's cautious hope of better days to come. He's starting to realize that you're okay. Who you are, sober, is all you need to be. It's step by step by step, you know? And, you know, we work on it every day. So I just no. take a deep breath and go, okay, we made it through another day. <laughs> can, we, can we do another one? That script I'm, I'm following out that I'm, that I'm writing right now and, and I'm living that movie. I keep saying that, living that movie, and the movie hasn't ended yet.